Welcome to the third day of the Collective Liberation, Disrupt, Dismantle, Manifest. We have um, had two days of really amazing programs, and I think today's sessions are going to be um, very interesting and um, require our attention and our um, ability to also disrupt, to dismantle, and manifest. Um, today's, before, I'm sorry, before I get to today's, we're going to have a, the moment of reflection, which is part of the experience for North American museums and other organizations. Um, we usually collaborate with a local indigenous community to develop a land acknowledgement specific to the conference location. This year, we are in different places and joined by people from many other places. So we ask that you please take a moment to reflect on the history, social circumstances, and personal experience that brought you and us to this moment. Um, I am in Manahata, um, which was the ancestral home of the Lenape, um, New York City, New Amsterdam um, is a center of immigration and um, so the combination of the Lenape Nation and the many, many centuries of immigration has brought me to this experience. Let's take a moment to reflect. Thank you. Um, as you can see, we have a very full day coming. Um, today's program has th three sessions and then a fourth um, extended discussion on how to bring disruption, dismantling, and manifest to our work in museums. And today we're going to look at conservation alternatives. This is one of the sessions. Um, this has been really exciting in this conference, looking at disruption of process um, of archival process and conservation specifically um, in museums and what it can bring to those of us who work with materials in museums, and of course, those of us who also visit museums. I guess I'm talking in the future tense, but we are going to go back to visiting museums. I am honored to introduce Aisha Fuentes, who is going to present on conservation alternatives, a structured discussion of what else it could mean to invest in material heritage and what we mean by structured discussion is that we will be holding on to your questions um, which we invite you to enter in either the Q&A or the chat function of your Zoom. I also want to remind everyone that we are um, honored with the presence of some really amazing ASL interpreters. Um, you will see them on your screen against a neutral background. If you want to make the ASL screen larger, you'll notice that at the top of the top of the rectangle there will be three dots and the magic three dots of zoom and you can select that screen and pin it where you want to use it on the third. You can also make it larger. So uh, I'd like to welcome Aisha Fuentes from Newcastle. And 
and um, we'll be turning over to her screen share. Through the magic room. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> So I just need you to stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. There we go. And here we go. All right. How's that look? Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, I stayed with my original title, title, which was just other conservations, because sometimes your best idea is the first idea. Um, so other conservations. Um, I wanted to start with an introduction to myself. My name is Aisha Fuentes, and I'm an objects conservator and technical historian with a specialization in the handling of anthropological and archaeological collections. Uh, I'm a graduate of the UCLA Getty MA program in the conservation of archaeological and ethnographic materials and currently a lecturer and researcher in arts conservation at Northumbria University in Newcastle upon Tyne uh, in Northeast England. I am also simultaneously completing my PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies or SOAS. Uh, at the University of London, where I combined conservation, ethnography, and visual cultural study to examine the historic and current uses of human remains in Tibetan ritual objects. As a conservator and arts technician, I have experience in fine arts museums, uh, natural history collections, on site with archaeological projects, and working abroad in local conservation laboratories in China, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Cambodia, and Sudan, uh, as, well as, as well as various cultural institutions in the US and UK. Now, I'm introducing myself this way uh, because though I was formally trained in the United States, um, as a result of my professional training and experiences, uh, I tend to think of conservation as a global practice uh, that is qualified by different types of expertise relative to the community it serves. This is not, however, I feel, uh, reflected in the way that conservation is defined as a profession today. Um, and I, especially here, especially at this particular meeting um, and with this group and this community, um, I really wanted to take an opportunity to identify and destabilize some of the biases, vocabularies, narratives, and definitions that are common to the ways in which my field has established its authority um, and the way that it's established its authority as an extension of museological practice. So first, I'll just to give you a sense of what I wanna to do today because I'm not gonna talk at you the entire time. That's really what I don't wanna do. Um, but, but first I'll talk at you. So first I'll talk a little about the history of conservation in museums uh, and some of the ways in which conservation's Eurocentric emphasis skews our practice with a short intro on conservation as a profession, its standards and a few key vocabularies. Um, and then I'd really like to generate some discussion uh, about how conservation practice could be, um, how we can expand its methods, how our skills can be made more useful to more people, um, and also how our field should expand to include a broader spectrum of stakeholders. This will involve a few case studies uh, and focused questioning to get the conversation rolling. Towards the end, of today's, uh, the end of today's session, I also want to look at a few examples of what I'm calling, just for the sake of, of today, uh, I'm calling it dynamic conservation methodologies. So um, conservation approaches or efforts um, or activities that are slightly more engaged, slightly more community-based, um, things like handling sessions, uh, the ways in which conservators facilitate repatriation, and also how we can document material knowledge and other forms of care. Uh, I want to do this in order to explore how conservators can be better colleagues within the museum, um, as well as look at how our work can have a broader positive impact on our communities. Okay, so just to start, uh, here is an image, and I apologize for the quality of the image, but I stole it off a publication. Um, so this is an image of the first triennial meeting of the International Institute for Conservation in London in 1967. 
and I think you'll find a lot of suits. Uh, everyone is looking very sharp, and uh, but relatively little melanin. Um, it's it's a fairly homogenous group there. So the prevailing narrative on the origin of our field is that conservation is a profession, uh, professional discipline that has its roots in the same 18th century intellectual climate that inspired the public museum as an institution, and its standards and practices reflect a preoccupation with the scientific method, taxonomy, and historical thinking. The conservation profession furthermore came of age through the establishment of museum practices over the course of the 19th and 20th century in Europe and the United States, um, or you could say Europe and the settler, uh, col settler colonies. Um, so the United States, Canada, Australia, the rest. Um, and has distinguished itself methodologically through the application of scientific thinking from restoration, which we define as the renewal of material and preservation, which we call the policies of maintenance. Um, and in the past 50 years, the field has further established itself by creating international guidelines for best practice uh, and mechanisms for professional development, like formalized training programs. So these are graduate training programs, for example, like the one I graduated from. Um, and professional organizations like the American Institute for Conservation, or here, as you see, the International Institute for Conservation. So already there's, there's this idea, there's a, an underlying narrative that the museum was invented in Europe and that conservation is an extension of that European invention, that European thinking. It's unique somehow. Um, so though they have changed and are changing still, the practices and ethical standards of conservation have been shaped by the institutions that have fostered them. Current conservation theory recommends methods of treatment that privilege the artifactual value of cultural objects, um, as well as their value as properties. So there's an emphasis uh, to always preserve the integrity of the original uh, and to document the material history as a derivative series of alterations. It would not be considered ethical practice, for example, to remove a layer of paint original to an object or to sand the buckled surface of a wooden mask. It is ethical, however, to reconstruct a broken ceramic, such as the lovely example you have on your screen, um, as long as we use a glue that can be easily detected, removed, and won't fundamentally alter the fabric of the object. The policy of minimum intervention uh, is increasingly common as a practice of modifying the object as little as possible and instead maintaining an optimum environment for its survival. And that optimum environment op often uh, relies on uh, environmental standards such as the control of the humidity or the temperature or the amount of light exposure, um, as well as the, its uh, handling. So uh, restricting handling, physical handling, for example. Conservation, uh, though through direct intervention or preventive maintenance, however, always assumes the continuity of the collected object as a historical and moreover, uh, as a historical object, sorry, and moreover as a property of the institution. So um, just to look here at this quote that I've taken from the Code of Ethics, this is the current Code of Ethics for the American Institute for Conservation, and this is the preamble that states the primary goal of conservation professionals, individuals with extensive training and special expertise um, is the preservation of cultural property. Cultural property consists of individual objects, structures, or aggregate collections. It is material which has significance that may be artistic, historical, scientific, religious, or social. And it is an invaluable and irreplaceable legacy that must be preserved for future generations. So a few of the things about this, um, one of the things already, it was recently made, made apparent to me or someone, someone said it to me that um, the code of ethics, the AIC's code of ethics actually hasn't been updated, I think in over 30 years. Um, so that's part of the issue. But also I just wanted to look at a couple of the key words here. So right away, we've got uh, extensive training and specialist, special expertise. Right, so what is that qualified by? Um, at the moment, it's qualified by a, a formal training program, generally in the United States and Europe, by a formal training program that includes the uh, study of science, the study of chemistry, a certain amount of fine arts background and handling practice, so material knowledge, as well as historical knowledge um, of these materials as artifacts. So usually some study of art, art history or archeology span or anthropology. 
Um, so that special expertise, the idea that this is a refined, you know, expert field. And also that it is applied to the preservation of cultural property. Um, so property is really, you know, highlighting the fact that it's about ownership, it's about custodianship, um, and it's tie or that it's tying custodianship to, to ownership. Um, the other thing that I just want to highlight here is the, the language that is invaluable, that these objects themselves, the material, are an invaluable and irreplaceable legacy that must be preserved for future generations. Um, and the, the thing that I find interesting under there is that it, it, it indicates kind of an idea of linear time. It indicates a certain relationship to future generations, and it indicates, uh, uh, you know, a sort of... Um, the, the way in which preservation works towards uh, kind of a resistance of, of linear time. Uh, and just so you guys know, I'm going to uh, post, I'll post a couple of links if you guys are interested at the end um, into the chat so that you, if you're interested in actually reading the full text of the Code of Ethics, for example, that's online and it's available. Um, so I'll drop that in there later. Okay, so another key concept. Um, inherent vice or the concept of deterioration. So that's really what we're working against, right? However, a challenge to conservation's fundamental goals of responsible custodianship is found in the very scientific knowledge from which it claims to derive its authority and expertise. Uh, for example, the second law of thermodynamics states that entropy will tend to increase in a closed system. Energy be, can be embodied as an object, for example, um, through the technology of its manufacturer, but it will tend to disperse itself and become unstable over time. In conservation, the concept of inherent vice has been developed to describe the liability of an object to decompose or deteriorate. So here I've included on the screen a uh, definition drawn from a glossary of archival and records terminology from 2012, and it states that inherent vice is the tendency in physical objects to deteriorate because of the fundamental instability uh, of the components of which they are made, as opposed to deterioration by external forces. Some objects embody their vice more dramatically, for example, an ice sculpture melting at room temperature or any number of Damien Hirst you know, installations, for example. Um, and some are subtle. So the darkening of amber and light, for example, takes more time relative to the amount of light exposure. Um, and temperature, I think. There's probably an amber specialist out there who knows exactly how that works. Uh, but everything is vulnerable to time in some way. In an institutional setting, inherent vice reflects the social and fiscal logic to preserve and maintain material culture, but uh, as one Buddhist saint told her son and disciple, we are all pregnant with death. The, con the concept of decomposition as a liability disproportionately affects objects that are not created with refined technologies and materials. And here I mean refined as the degree to which they are artificial or modified as raw materials that have undergone a process of skill. This headdress, for example, uh, on the screen, is suffering from the fact it is made of feathers and animal fibers. It was damaged by its use in performances and social rituals, and then it was placed in a crowded museum storage with a moth infestation. It is tough or maybe unfair to say whether the object's inherent vice is actually internal, such as the fragility of the feathers or its function in its source community, uh, or external in terms of its use and circulation as a cultural property. But the valuation of a work to an institution as an asset, as a cultural property, is at least partially based on its physical chemical stability, longevity, and potential as an artifact. Fragile objects are a liability and inaccessible objects use up expensive storage space. So following that brief, somewhat critical introduction to conservation, um, I want us to now look at a few ways uh, that we can imagine alternatives to this practice, its vocabulary and its narratives. Um, and I want this to be a very open discussion for both conservators, if they are present, and also our museum colleagues. And this is partially because I feel that our field, uh, the field of conservation, is fairly hermetic. Um, we have an approach to our, es our expertise that's almost esoteric. You know, it's, it's, you're, it's accessible only through a process of initiation. Um, 
and it's very difficult. I have found that it's difficult to engage with from outside uh, the conservation field. So I really want to try to get past that. And I, I really do strongly encourage um, the participation of everybody here, if you're comfortable. Um, I also say, so it, it, there's question and answer if, if you prefer to save them to the end. But if I'm going to ask a series of direct questions, they're mostly short answer. Um, there may be a couple where you have to rank uh, certain, certain options that I'll present on the screen, but you're welcome to add, answer in the chat. Um, I really wanna see you know, the feedback if someone has something that they wanna bring up. And if you wanna raise your hand or contribute anything at any point, um, please, please do feel free. So uh, yeah, answer in chat, raise your hand, DM, whatever is most comfortable for you, but I really don't wanna be the only one talking the entire time. So I really hope I hear from you during the course of this. Okay, so first one, and this is something I have to say, I've done with my students because I feel like it's, uh, it's, it's fairly accessible. So uh, discussion prompt one, Edward Colston was a 17th, 18th century uh, slaver and philanthropist and his statue was removed from public display and discarded in the river um, during the Black Lives Matter protests last summer. So first time that I use this, I gave it to my conservation students and I'll give it to you now. And I'll just ask you very simply, and please do feel free to answer in the chat. Is this damage? So are these material alterations working against this? Uh, are they working against this, this statue being an invaluable and irreplaceable legacy that must be preserved for future generations? Um, if you were a conservator, for example, how would you describe, thank you, Sina, how would you describe exactly what's happened? So they've actually recovered the statue now, they've taken it out of the river, and they're now going to put it in a museum. And I'm trying to imagine, and I would like, especially the conservators out there to imagine that this statue comes in, and it comes into your lab and you have to write a condition report for it. How do we describe this? Do we describe it as damage? Has this in fact changed the value of the object? How has it changed the value of the object? How stable is it? And how is that related to the object's value? Especially when it's so much of conservation rhetoric seems to, seems to impress, seems to really emphasize stability. So how would you describe, so definitely no, not damaged. Hi, Abby, thank you. Um, so I just want you guys to start thinking about that. What about this one? What is the value of stability here? Okay, so is it value added? Is it value added or is it damaged? And is that not in any way in tension with established conservation ethics? Yes, very good. Okay, so here's just another one from the same, the same protests. We don't want you to be a conserv conservator, Trisha, please. Very good, okay. so. Another example from the same series of protests, um, Churchill's statue, which was in London, this isn't in Bristol, but in London, um, this was altered during the protest. And this is the way I actually really struggled when I was, when I was trying to come up with a way to describe this using you know, technical conservation material best, based speak as I would do um, if someone had handed it to me as a conservator and said, write a condition report for this object. I would say that there are, there's evidence of alterations to the object made during the Black Lives Matter protests versus conservation efforts, which you see on the right here. So on the left, you see those alterations. And on the right, you see what I feel like is conservation, which is really sequestering the object, it's protecting the object, it's conserving the object by restricting access to it, both through the holding, so you can see it's boxed up there, and also through the fact, by the fact that it's under heavy guard, um, which is quite remarkable as well. Okay, very good, alteration. So alteration, not necessarily damage, but alteration. So we're talking about maybe a little bit more about object biography, for example, um, or narrating biography of objects more than we're necessarily talking about that this as a deleterious project or process as something that, that is damaged. Culturally important additions would be more damaged through removal. Okay, so really just, it's a question of defining the value, right? Defining the value of the alterations and defining the value of those alterations in relation to stability, um, which would be, I suppose, technically what we would be striving for here, but is it really stability that's adding value to this object? These are in public space. Yep, they're both, they're both public monuments. 
Uh, okay, does it make a difference to conservation goals if the object is in a restricted re repository as in a library or museum versus in the public space? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think the idea, the sense that I have as a conservator based on my training and based also on what I'm meant to be educating others in now, since apparently I'm a conservation educator, um, is that it shouldn't make a difference is that the, uh, the object is an object of social, historical, cultural value, and therefore we should strive for its stability. Monuments in public are living documents that can and should change. Interesting distinction between public and private. So if something is within an institution versus something that is public, and that, that could be a question of ownership as well. Um, fantastic, okay. All right. So that was my first example. It was just a, just a brief warm up and really examining the idea of what is damage. How do we how do you write a condition report for something that's been damaged um, through social change? If the question is about preserving what is historically versus significant, very good. Okay, preserving the alterations, for example, anything that has changed from the, the monument took a swim, preserving the writings on it. And also another thing about this alley is that I actually thought they should have left this, the uh, statue in the river and then made that an exhibition because I would have really enjoyed watching it slowly die at the bottom of the river. But that's just me and they didn't do that, sadly. Um, Yes, stakeholders are different in a restricted repository versus public spaces. Okay, so again, we're talking about ownership versus custodianship versus public space. Okay, damage, whoop, okay. I'm interested in the notion of damage and what preservation reservation can do to damage people, not necessarily property. Okay, so image, so intangible practice versus tangible practice. This is material integrity versus maybe social integrity, community integrity, and how we may or may not be working against that. Um, it might damage the river. It might have damaged the river, but that dam that that river's it's pretty dirty. Um, yeah, no, I would, <laughs> well, nobody asked me if they were going to leave it in the river, but, you know, I'm just sitting up here being American. No, definitely no one wanted to hear with me what they should have done with the Colston statue. Okay, so just fleshing out a little bit, ideas of damage, ideas of condition, stability, things like that. Moving on to the next case study. Brigido Lara. Uh, okay, so Brigido Lara pictured here with one of his pieces is, which is now owned by the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. Um, he has gone to jail for his work in recreating a pre-Columbian ceramic tradition in Eastern Mexico in the later half of the last century. Formally untrained, Lara first started making copies of local archeological models in his teens and through trial and error, learned to refine the local clays and construct these objects uh, so that they were stylistically and technically indistinguishable from ancient examples. He sold them to passersby and ran into trouble when they were mistaken by experts as authentic who accused him of looting. He now works as a restorer in the local anthropological museum and still makes originals, though he is now careful to sign his work before it goes on the market. Though his skill has frustrated the cultural institutions who purchased his pieces from intermediaries, I think Lara has achieved something rather remarkable through labor. Technical expertise, which he cultivated himself, and empirical knowledge by placing himself in a continuity of locally resolved material cultural practice. He has been described as, quote, a reformed forger, uh, but I prefer to see him as a genuine conservator with extraordinary technical skill. Furthermore, I think his work arguably represents an innovation in a longer tradition of regional ceramic construction and can be interpreted as an authentic contemporary expression of an historical tradition. So here is my next question. Is he a conservator? Is he a conservator? And how does that question, how does this tension, how does his story illustrate or provoke uh, the ways in which conservation values objects over labor? I'm giving you a moment to think about whether or not Brigitte Lara is a conservator. 
He can be both an artist conservator. And thank you, Monica, that's a very good point. So in the history of conservation, in the beginning, in the, in the before times, uh, arts practitioners were conservators and conservators were arts practitioners. And it was a very close relationship between those skill set. It is only recently that we've started to see the distinction between the two. And it's now something that's very distinct where you have professional conservators who have very little arts practice and they don't necessarily, that, that distinction of expertise doesn't extend to arts practitioners. So that's a very good point. Thanks, Monica. Okay. Julian, my gut says he's a conservator, but wor when working on ancient cultural belongings, but when making his own work, he is not acting in that capacity. So not a conservator when he's working in his own work. Sina says, in my view, if he was able to match the skill of pre-Columbian artists, then he is conserving the craft skill. Uh, Cynthia says, as someone who is not part of that culture, I don't think I can say if he's a conservator, okay. Um, but if he is bringing care to the objects that that community appreciates as a preservation of their culture, then sure. So he is working locally as a conservator at the at the Anthropological Museum. Um, I think this also speaks to your question earlier on what constitutes the special training that conservators must have. Indeed, that was something that I'm trying to look at um, and also how that training qualifies you as a certain type of expert, um, right? So again, I really, that's something that I really wanna to get to is undermining these concepts of expertise. Um, okay. Juliana says that she would consider him a conservator, but the code of ethics wouldn't, probably not. Um, hi, Julia Brennan, my hero, uh, says that an artist and one that preserves the traditions of his culture with authenticity and respect. Very good. Um, so that doesn't necessarily need to be a conservator. Does he need to be a conservator? That's a good question. Why not honor him as an artist? Like, why does there need to be a distinction between the two? Very good. Ariel says, uh, people in positions of power with sanctioned expertise might say no. Indeed, they would. And indeed, they had a problem with him uh, because, of course, they, uh, yeah, exactly. Thanks, Julia. What defines a conservator? But going back to Ariel's point that, of course, people in positions of power with sanctioned expertise say no, um, that's also because they work for people who have invested in these properties as a certain type of artifact. So the idea that you would spend a certain amount of money and that you would then acquire these objects that would become assets of an institution and that, that those assets, the, the financial value of those assets would then be undermined by the fact that he tricked you, that he tricked you with his skill, that he tricked you with his expertise. Great. So Julia says, what defines a conservator? Many kinds, really. That's exactly what I'm trying to get to. Um, I think the fact that the, that, that the conservator, that a, a conservator has become such a narrow definition is actually working against us. Because especially you look at the way that we work in collections, the way that we work in the field. Um, Julia does a lot of work uh, outside museums. Um, and the way that you see other people acting as conservators. As far as I'm concerned, the cleaners are conservators. The, the gallery attendants are conservators. I'm a conservator too. The preparators are, the mount makers. All of these people are handling these objects and they're really investing in the custodianship of these objects. I would say as well that arts practitioners are conservators. Um, so that's just me though. It's just something that I want us all to think about as well. Is who do, you know, why do we have such a narrow definition of, of who, who is a, conser uh, a conservator? And why has it been narrowed to this very particular formal training and expertise? Ali says, as a museum professional, this conversation almost seems like it's following a similar track to the idea of our fieldwide conservations about how the word curate is used by other fields. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and conservations within our field about what makes a curator and a curatorial authority. That's exactly the same, except that we're looking at it from the technical perspective. Um, we're looking at it from the material knowledge perspective, which is supposed to be what conservators are invested in, I think. Um, okay. Yes, also issues of authenticity. What is authenticity? It's culturally conditioned. It's specific to where you are and the time in which you are and the specific values with which you're interacting. So that's also a fantastic point um, about authenticity. And yeah, it's again, it's something to undermine. And a lot of times it's something that's built really on a, on a, 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 on a model of, of, of fiscal value um, and of, of the value of objects, valuing objects over people, which has been a consistent theme or the labor of people, which has definitely been a consistent theme over the past three days. Okay, yes, fantastic. Okay, thanks everybody. All right, so let's move on from here to another type of conservation. 
we're going to step back from the Anthropocene. Again, sorry about the quality of this image if it's looking a little blurry, but I just stole it off the internet. Um, so stepping back from, from just people and material heritage, I want to look at a different type of conservator um, and a conservationist, really, which is a common misunderstanding outside museums, probably. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of you have worked with conservators um, and maybe with conservationists as well. Uh, but the difference between the two, so a conservator is someone who uh, invests in material heritage, who works with material heritage, uh, a conservationist works with animals and wildlife and ecosystems. Um, so this is just a random comparison based on a common misunderstanding, and it could be about endangered languages, it could be any other analogy, but I just decided to go with this one because I thought, why not? Um, so this came to me <laughs> while I was watching The Secret Life of the Zoo, which is a show on Channel 4 here, and I watched all nine seasons of it because it's just people caring for animals, and for some reason that really got me through lockdown. Um, but here you have an image of one of the zookeepers, and she's actually holding a mountain chicken frog, and this is a frog that's highly endangered. Um, it's highly endangered because of threats to its, to its habitat, but also because apparently it's delicious. Um, but it's specific to two islands in the Caribbean, so Dominica and Montserrat, um, and they're trying to breed them. And a lot of what you see in this show, The Secret Life of the Zoo, and what you see when you visit zoos, uh, is that it's breeding programs. It's all about breeding programs, and it's a lot of times it's about trying to breed animals in order to safeguard their eventual disappearance in the wild. Um, so that's the idea behind zoos. It's, keeping animals, breeding them, trying to breed this kind of select, you know, safeguard this just in case everything else goes wrong, we at least have this, you know, this, this reserve of these, these species and these, these forms. Although they're alive, obviously. Um, so versus, you know, something like pastoralism, for example. So here is an example of a, an illustration of a Fulani herder in Southwest Nigeria. Uh, who's demonstrating resourcefulness. You can see the trough that he's got going there, um, which is, even has covering on it so that the water doesn't all evaporate, um, which is fantastic. But his practice, um, so demonstrating his resourcefulness, but also a system of animal custodianship that is historically low impact for the eco ecosystems in which it is practiced. Um, that his, that, uh, practice of custodianship, however, is itself now under threat from industrialization, climate change, and violence from state and non-state actors. Um, so it's just another model of conservation, we could think. So here's a question that I would like to pose to everyone. If we, as museums, were to draw an analogy, which of these wildlife conservation models most resembles current museum practice? One, Noah's Ark. I'm assuming you're all familiar with the story. Uh, two, the zoo. So the selective breeding of endangered species, um, safeguarding against habitat destruction, things like that. Uh, or a taxidermy collection. So dead animals that we've stuffed and we've preserved indefinitely. Uh, protected ecosystems. So is wildlife conservation, is our model of conservation more like a protected ecosystem? Is the museum a protected ecosystem, like a nature reserve or a national park, where we have this specific protected environment? Um, and that goes back to what you guys were saying about, um, about whether it's a public monument versus a private monument, right? So that question of ownership. Um, or is a museum most like nomadic pastoralism, so low impact, sustainable? Um, okay, Cena says three. Hang on, Belinda, I'll get back to you. Brooke says one, we're most like Noah's Ark. Zoo, <laughs> taxidermy, taxidermy. Everybody's feeling taxidermy. Taxidermy with a little bit of the zoo. Taxidermy, okay, so taxidermy and Absolutely no shade to people who work with taxidermy because there's some really good ones out there. But taxidermy is looking at dead animals, right? It's preserving species as dead animals. So taxidermy, dead stuff, not caring for where it came from. Fantastic, okay. So people are saying one, two, three. We're not saying protected ecosystem and we're not saying nomadic pastoralism. So we're not saying necessarily sustainability, low impact and sustainable. And we're not saying protected ecosystem in that it's a, it's a protected environment in which these, the, 
you know, there's a certain amount of wildlife still, and the, the wild creatures are still free. Um, instead, we're talking about dead things. That's fantastic. Okay, I'm going to go back to Valinda's point because I didn't, I didn't want to scoot over you. Hold on. So Valinda says, to be contrarian with regard to the expansive definition of conservator, when we have an area of disagreement over decision making, like lighting requirements or framing requirements, uh, it is our niche expertise considered equal to someone with a different niche expertise, saying this as a black paper conservator who has not always been granted the same level of authority as, for example, a non-black being. Yes. Okay. That's fantastic. That's, that's very good. Um, I suppose the question is, <laughs> If the if the value of the expert like why why would we be splicing within that expertise? It should be that your expertise is qualified in the same way. I think that's the idea behind formal training programs, right? That's what it should be. It should be you complete the program, you check the box, you become an expert, you're qualified according to the AIC's definition, and then it shouldn't really matter, right? Um, in terms of in terms of the rest of it, hell is other people, and nowhere is that more true than working in a museum. Okay. Uh, and I apologize if that was only half a response to you. I'm going to go back here. So Sarah, again, says three. Again, we're back to taxidermy. So mostly people saying three. Um, a stuffed animal is just so far removed from its natural condition. We just ha want that dead thing to be in our collection. It's OK, good. So we're looking again at how those animals, those vibrant, living, sentient beings have been reduced to properties, how they have been stabilized which is really what we're trying to do, um, and how they've been sequestered, which is really a lot of the project of, of conservation is trying to limit its exposure to anything that, that would um, really tr trigger its inherent vices, right? So anything that would destabilize it. All right, a few more examples here. So I just wanted to talk a few, just give a few examples of dynamic conservation methodologies. So that's what I'm just calling it. If someone else has a better way to talk about this, that's fantastic. Um, and I'm looking at things like um, handling sessions or the ways in which conservators have facilitated repatriation. And this is especially uh, relevant for North American indigenous groups, for example. Uh, we recently here in the UK, which is a whole other kettle of fish, uh, they recently started talking about returning the bronzes to Benin and Nigeria, for example. Um, so that question of repatriation, that's something that conservators can and have done, uh, identifying objects and connecting them with those pathways. So the example that I've given here is from a video, uh, a video called Everything Was Carved. Um, it was produced by the Pitt Rivers Museum and is a document of their collaboration with the Haida Gwaii people uh, who came over and they were looking at objects. They were taking the objects out and they had craftsmen, they had carvers who came in and actually as a follow-up, they had a series of carvers come in and actually start to replicate the objects. So this is museum sanctioned replication of historic materials. Um, and it's really in the service of reactivating those techniques and learning from historic objects in order to preserve them. So this was an example of something that I thought was a little more positive. Uh, and if you have any examples of that, if you have any examples from your own institutions where you felt like a conservator especially has been especially forthcoming in, in um, making objects accessible and making technologies accessible, for example, through imaging techniques, um, through documentation, through 3D scanning, through CT scanning, whatever it is, the, the types of technical things that we can facilitate. Um, if you do have an example of that, please drop it in the chat or save it for the Q&A and maybe we can talk about it um, because I would really love to hear more about that. I just chose this example because it's something that I'm familiar with and I know that the Pitt Rivers Museum has done these kinds of handling sessions and visitations um, with a, a number of communities. So here's another one. Oh, and I'll drop you a link for that too as well. Uh, another example of dynamic conservation methodology, so documenting intangible heritage. And this is an example um, and from the Endangered Material Knowledge Program. And full disclosure, I am a grant holder from this program, um, but not for this particular project. I'm working on a different project that's uh, more about Tibet. But just so you know, I, I, they did give me money. Um, 
but I, it's partially because that money is going towards a project that I feel like is an application of conservation um, in the right direction. So this is an example of documenting leather making technologies in the Kalahari. Uh, and what is nice about this, I feel, is that it involves a collaboration between a conservator um, who's based here in the UK and a conservator who's based in Botswana. So you've got local conservation knowledge. You've also got the knowledge of the people within the communities who are practicing this. Um, those are all stakeholders that are required for this grant. So I think that's something that's really interesting. I think it's something that really appeals to me personally. Um, and it's a grant scheme that, that I feel is going in a good direction because at least it's trying to make conservation knowledge applicable towards practice and how we can actually use our, our technical expertise, our material expertise to document intangible heritage and material knowledge practice. Okay. Bring in, the, bring in the, the wonderful, wonderful examples. So at the Museum of Fine Arts, St. Petersburg in Florida, they have an exhibition called Explore the Vaults where the guests are invited to put on a white cotton gloves, oh my God, and go through multiple dresser drawers of light sensitive photographs that are typically not on show. I'm assuming the gloves are for handling the drawers and not the objects. Who's feeling me on that? But that's good. So drawers, I love interactive displays. I think everybody does, right? And the Pitt Rivers Museum handling, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, but I do love an interactive display. I love visible storage. I think that's fantastic. Um, I love handling sessions. Like I think all of that is really good. But if anybody else has any other thing that they've seen a conservator do or sign into uh, or sign on to, I should say, um, that they feel has been especially productive or positive, then please do share it. Um, we need more examples of that because a lot of times, um, as one colleague put it, she uh, surveyed everyone in her museum and she asked them to uh, summarize the role of the conservator in two words. And the two words were not possible. So we have a reputation for really limiting exposure, limiting access, um, and really being the final line of saying no. That's not going anywhere. No, it won't be stable if it moves. It won't be stable if we throw it in the river. It won't be stable if um, we repatriate it because we don't know what kind of conditions it'll be It'll be kept under. Um, so I really, I really, if anybody has any more examples of this, like please, please do share them. Oh, and then the other example, and again, I'll drop a, a, a note about this that I feel like is a really positive step. Um, there is a recent publication, for example, um, that's looking at uh, documenting the local um, care practices, materials, and techniques for the conservation and care of textiles in Southeast Asia. Julia Brennan, I know you're here. Um, and I'll drop a link to that as well because it was a it was a collaboration between someone who is a textile conservator based in Washington DC and her colleagues in Southeast Asia, as well as local communities. So uh, untrained conserv what we would call un in informal conservators or people who have material knowledge that isn't conditioned outside the museum or conditioned outside the conservation profession, and really talking to people about how do you use local materials to care for objects. Um, and the difference to that, of course, would be a con conservator going over and saying, okay, let's import all of our materials from some museum um, provider, for example, and, and, and then apply those. And instead of doing that, actually trying to use what's locally accessible and the technical knowledge that, and the technical expertise that's local as well. So I'm going to drop a link to that um, when I come out of the, the, the uh, presentation, but it's that kind of work where we're actually looking at other forms of care in a very technical way that conservators have been trained to do, I feel like is really valuable. Um, Rachel says at one of my for former jobs, there were, albeit rare, opportunities to tour the on-site conservation lab. Okay, so lab tours, good too. And the conservators talk to groups uh, and, and uh, about their jobs pretty openly. I love it when conservators are open. I love it when they interact with the public. I love it when they interact with their colleagues. Um, again, that's something that I just really, I, as a conservator, I want to work against, and I want to figure out other ways for all of us to work against that uh, so that we're not quite so hermetic um, and mysterious and expert. Okay, Cynthia says, my, obje my object conservator colleagues here at Yale Art Gallery collaborate with conservators and material experts in Nigeria. Great to learn about the artist Bamboye. Uh, 
and share treatment techniques all virtually because of the pandemic, of course, was presented at AIC this year. Okay, great. So there's going to be probably, I'm assuming, a, a, a um, publication that comes out of that, or at least a link to a recorded uh, talk. And Ariel says, I feel like prints and drawings, study rooms, very good, uh, can and do create some opportunities for access, but most I can think of uh, privilege access for students or scholars. So I think knowing about the prints and study rooms is maybe the problem as well. Um, I think most conservators probably, if, if you ask them, would be interested in making objects available. Um, I know I would, but maybe that's just me. I don't know. Uh, but it is maybe just a question of knowing that that can be accessible or that certain kinds of objects are maybe better for younger younger groups and certain kinds of objects um, could be accessible to all types of people. But I think those are the kinds of decisions that we're never even asked to make. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to end on a, I'm getting towards the end of things. So my personal model for material heritage as practice is the tamalada. Um, I didn't grow up around my Mexican family. I don't know them. Um, and when I was growing up, my dad instead would make tamales. He would invite all of the neighbors and all of our friends and everybody would come over and they would get very drunk, of course, but we would make tamales at Christmas. Um, that was our version of the tamalada. And however it was that he learned how to do that, he then taught me. So now wherever I go, and I've done this in Bhutan, I've done this in London, I've now done this up here in Newcastle, I will make tamales at Christmas and I'll make it by myself or I'll make it with my friends and I'll make it using whatever I can find locally. So the filling might change, the form might change, um, but I would never in a million years actually take a bunch of tamales and sequester them and be like, here, I just wanna save this dozen tamales so that I can give them to future generations. For me, the, my personal model of material heritage is to learn the technique and to share the technique and to grow it um, and to not become attached to the form necessarily, but rather to the, the, the ways in which that, that material knowledge transfer helps me express something about who I am. Um, okay. Let's see if I've missed any comments here. Julia says, try local community-based care workshops. Okay, listen to Julia, Julia's amazing. Try local community-based care workshops and invite people who own the artifacts or objects to DIY take steps to care for them themselves and share ideas and cull pool better decisions. Okay, great. So getting more ideas from more people from the get-go, not just necessarily coming up with a treatment proposal and then sharing it and being like, does that sound okay? which I know you know from, from curatorial practice is pretty much how consultations go. You come up with an idea, then you invite some people in and you say, does that sound good? And then they say, sure. Um, but I think the idea of actually coming up with the treatment of coming up with the sharing practices in advance um, and collaboratively could be a good way to go. Sina says, does it enter into conservation ethics that conservators could uh, or should be as close to the material culture they are specialist in it not? It's a way of conserving tradition and practices. That is a really interesting point and something that I take very personally because I'm talking about the Tamalada here because it's personally relevant to me, but I'm actually a specialist in Tibet and Buddhist cultures. I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Tibetan, I'm not even Asian, um, but it does to me at least matter that I speak Tibetan because that becomes part of the practice because I want to speak to all of the, the object makers, but also because that language is important to preserve to me. And actually speaking that language to me becomes part of my conservation practice. Um, but I don't think you'll find that in many people, not in a lot of people at least. Um, okay, Sarah Sims says, this is less public facing, but I feel our conservator has been able, uh, has done a great job of being accessible and sharing her work with our staff. Tell her. Um, I think sometimes the work positions of certain staff members is treated as special and exclusive even towards our own co co-workers. Nodding, lots of nodding from me on the conservation side. Um, especially typically frontline staff, reinforcing hierarchies within museums, absolutely 100%. Um, our conservator hosts a local presentation for our staff and regularly shares images of her works and progress. So that's fantastic. So the conservator making herself and her work transparent to everyone so they all understand what's happening. Everyone gets to share that expertise. Um, 
I will also share a, a, a story from that when I was in, uh, when I was doing a, you know, my internships before I went into a training program, the museum that I was working with, I was talking to a gallery attendant and uh, we were talking about that hierarchy and the way that she put it is some people walk around here like they've got three boobs. And I really liked that. Uh, I never wanna be one of those conservators, let alone one of those museum workers who thinks she has three boobs. So Monica says, I love that people are sharing. Uh, I also love that people are sharing because it's giving me something to read. Uh, it demonstrates the lack of knowledge about this aspect of many museums maybe due to the focus on published resources. Very good. Uh, for those of us who center this uh, in our practice, know many of others who do so as well, uh, we tend to work with each other and to learn from each other. And again, it's about communication and transparency and conservators kind of coming out of the lab a little bit uh, and really being in conversation with the other people who are working in the museum. Um, who are all of you, of course. We're part of a community here and our, our aims are one thing. Um, yes, okay. Uh, Emily, I'm gonna skip you because you're off topic, but it is related to the Colston statue. So if you're interested, go back. Uh, yes, okay. Yes, three boobs is hilarious. Um, and it really, really resonates, especially the next time that you're walking around a museum and you're like, man, one of these three boobs checks, but please, okay. Uh, Belinda says, I think there is a different perspective for photo am albums or family Bibles. A lot of your ideas seem much more oriented towards anthropological objects. For a lot of African American families, these are the only tangible heritage uh, artifacts that they have. Okay, great. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of outreach programs for people to care for their own collections. That's fantastic. And that is, um, I think that's very much related to what we're talking about, which is um, expanding the ways and expanding that, that community of custodians, expanding that community of, of care experts, right? So it's not necessarily something that is um, specific to the conservator and only the conservator makes decisions or only the museum expert gets to make decisions, but that other people get to make decisions as well. But you are correct, Valinda. And as I said at the beginning, my perspective is, is very much uh, conditioned by the fact that I work with anthropological and archeological uh, collections and that I also work with a lot of um, displaced materials, we should say. Okay. I'm gonna move on to one more discursive point, um, and then I think I just open it up if anybody has any questions that have come in. Um, okay, <clears throat> just to get us thinking about what conservation should be and how we can be better colleagues. Um, oh, that's a good one. Okay, uh, so to think about how we can be better colleagues and getting back to that issue of good projects, you know, ways in which conservation has made itself accessible, for example. Um, I invite you to rank either in the chat here or just, you know, on your own, the following priorities in facilitating access to museum objects from most to least importance. So one being material integrity. That's the stability that's really at the center of conservation practice of our established standards, you know, preserving the object indefinitely. Uh, two, access to the adult public. Three, access to students. Is it more important that objects are accessible to the adult public? And physically, I'm talking about physically accessible. I'm talking about handling. Access to the adult public, access to students, access to practicing artists, makers, or fabricators, or access to researchers like academic specialists and curators. So these are people who have been qualified as experts, for example. Yes, good question. Who gets to be a researcher? Is so one of the reasons why I made these arbitrary distinctions between these groups is that, of course, we can't actually separate. How do you separate a practicing artist from a researcher? Do you say that if they're going in there, if someone is in art school and you go into a museum because you want to get ideas, are you not doing research? Fantastic. Um, Monica says, I think we need to move away from qualifying access. Access for anyone should be the goal. Fantastic. Okay, great. Great access for anyone. But again, that is. Is that is that in in uh, tension with the idea of material integrity? So I'm I'm obviously not looking for a solution to this. I'm just trying to, you know, get people thinking about the ways in which conservation imagines itself within these space and the way conservation imagines itself facilitating certain types of access, um, and if it needs to prioritize that, or if indeed the the goal should be. Um, access for everyone, if it should be open access, um, which actually goes into probably 
my second favorite model for material heritage, which is the mobile library that they put on the camels in Pakistan, um, where you actually could just, what if you could actually circulate the object? And I know there's mobile museums and those are fantastic too. Um, but if what if you could circulate the objects as broadly as possible to share them with people so they could actually learn from them in a material way? I think that would be really fun. Tim Roo says, what is the use of indefinite preservation if there isn't <laughs> human condition? I'm done here. I don't need to say anything. That was it. That was pretty much the whole point of the entire thing. What is the use of indefinite preservation if there isn't the human connection or access? Indeed. Thank you. You've done my work for me, Tim. Okay, I'm gonna end here, actually. Uh, I'm gonna end my presentation at least and maybe we'll have a bit of a discussion. Um, I'm gonna end with a quote from a friend of mine who noticed this when I was talking about it and said, letting things die is a decolonizing process. Um, so the resistance to the idea of indefinite preservation as Tim has just wonderfully pointed out. Uh, and I ended it with an illustration of um, Charles Byrne, who is also known as the Irish giant. In fact, it says it in his display text, if you can see that. Uh, he died when he was 22 years old, and he requested at his death that because he, uh, during his life, was on display and worked in circuses because he had, uh, I can't remember what the actual term is, but he was, he was very, very tall. He was seven foot seven. Um, but he was on display a lot in his life and he asked that his body be thrown into the sea is the story, but it's not written down. There's no legal document. So his body was obtained because there was no legal document. So this is also an interesting, you know, that interesting tension between legal and ethical, um, which again, you know, <laughs> because they're not the same thing. Um, this guy has been on display in the Hunterian Museum for a long time and the citizens of Galway, where he's from, have been asking for him to come back. Um, so this is very literally letting someone die um, and letting them die as they had requested to die instead of putting them on perpetual display. Um, yes, okay, Julia, yes, let the impermanence come. I tried to go light on the Buddhism today you know what I said? It's, I'm all about impermanence. I did quote Matthew Labdron, who said that we are all pregnant with death, which is a very Buddhist idea. Fantastic. And Barbara says the hopeful model is um, available to curator in order to display it to everyone in conditions that will not damage you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if, there, if, if there's any discussion, if anyone has anything they actually want to speak to. Oh, geez. Well, we did have a uh, comment from Belinda. Yeah. Uh, but bringing it home. Yes, in Virginia, most of the Confederate statues are being preserved with the alterations as part of the history of the artifact. Um, and these are things that were um, changed as of 2020. Mm -hmm. Is this policy? Do you have any comment on that? My comment is I'm waiting for conservation professional organizations to catch up with the rest of us because people are making decisions like that. They are making you know decisions about the preservation of uh, alterations and how that uh, is a document of changing value for these materials. But I don't feel that our professional organizations, I don't feel that our training um, and I don't feel that our codes of ethics actually are up to speed with that. But I think we're working on it as a field and I, um, but I will say also that some of those conversations are happening uh, within professional organizations, but they aren't happening in the same way that we're just saying, like, what, what if we just broke down the museum? What if science isn't the only science? You know what I mean? Like, what if museums weren't invented in Europe? Like, I feel like there's just a lot more that we can do and there's a lot more work to go. To, to, to go forward. Um, so yeah, I think th those are all completely appropriate conservation decisions, but um, you know, I'm not really sure how you could defend them in terms of the actual standard technical code of ethics. Uh, and that's just something that needs to be innovated on our side in our professional development organizations. Um, and another question in the, in the Q and A um, from Juliana. Uh, do you have any advice for future curators, undergraduate students preparing for graduate school? What is your hope for the next generation of conservators? Oh, I speak more languages. This conversation. <laughs> speak more languages and learn an endangered skill. That's what my hope is. 
Like I, I keep reading about, you know, they're, they're running out of people who know how to blow flat glass. Why aren't we learning how to blow flat glass? Why aren't we learning these skills that it turns out were actually more sustainable than the industrialized things that, that came after it? Um, so I think that, that conservation, the fact that we have this background in arts practice, I hope that the future has uh, more outreach, more, more transparency, but I also hope that we have more material practice, that we actually learn and practice things like languages, like specific techniques. Um, yeah, that I mean, I think that's more of a conservation problem um, than a than a curatorial problem. But you know, you can still learn another language as a curator. I feel like there's a, and especially in conservation, there's a real dominance of English um, in the English language, and I feel like that's something that's just it, it's again, it's reinforcing that that distinction between experts and non-experts. Yeah, Heritage Crafts UK. Thank you, Gregor. Very good. Do you have more questions for me? Sorry. Um, I can see the chat too, so I can go over here. I can see the chat. Got, oh, it's an interesting um, question about letting visitors handle raw materials or re replicas. Yeah, replicas are great for that because I mean, and that's another thing that conservators can do. We should be able to fabricate a replica. Um, and you can, you know, distinguish it as a replica. But I think replicas are great. You know, they've got that at the VNA, for example. You can put your hand in the like the the fist of mail, the like armored suit, and you can put your hand in it and actually learn how to operate it. Um, I think it's important because it's important to the project of what I imagine conservation should be, which is really the preservation of material knowledge. Um, but obviously, it's also important because it's it's accessible to more types of being. You know, it's a it's accessible in a neurodiverse way. Um, it isn't necessarily reliant on sight. Uh, and reading and things like that. So I think it's a, it's a different way to experience the objects. And I know this from having conservation students um, and also from having been an arts practitioner for my entire life, um, that some people just don't, don't read by looking, you know? And especially if you're a material specialist, you gotta take it apart. You know, you gotta take, you gotta turn it over. And that photo that I shared of the, the Haida woman who's looking at the, bath, uh, the, the hat, she's actually smelling it she was looking at how it had been finished in terms of the technique, and then she put it on to see how it fit. Because that's very important material information, you know what I mean? That's very important to know that in terms of preserving how these objects are made, how they can be made in the future. Um, and I think that's another point that I'm, I'm not sure I made, which is that material traditions are allowed to change. Uh, and that's something that we find a lot of resistance to uh, as well. And we'll say there's a traditional um, way of doing things. And then there's the kind of future technology, innovation, inauthentic way of doing things. But I think we could actually imagine, you know, that technology is a traditional, is a tradition of material knowledge transfer. Um, and that it actually, you know, it starts with woodblock printing and then it ends with, inkjet printing, for example, these are things that are on a continuity. Um, and I, th I think that's something that that just needs to change in the narrative and the way that we talk about materials and innovation and the use of the use of new materials. Loads of loads and loads and loads of uh, chat in here, which is fantastic. It's lots of chat, fewer questions because You've been asking questions, so people want to chat. Yeah, no. <laughs> I want. I mean, I was hoping that this would happen. I've, there's got back and forths here. You've got people talking to each other, which is fantastic. Um, that was definitely the point. So Gregor's jumped in with the Heritage Crafts uh, Heritage Crafts Association here in the UK is fantastic. That's actually where I got that detail about the blowing the glass, the flat blown glass, because apparently there's only one guy in Birmingham who can do it. Um, and I was like, well, I could learn that. That should be my job as a conservator. I go out and I learn how to do that. And I preserve that technology. Um, yes to visitors handling raw materials uh, or replicas at least. And then we've got this back and forth between Tim and Belinda, which I'm just gonna let them have that and everybody else can, can read that as well, which is fantastic. There's no reason for conservators, Belinda says, there's no reason for conservators to always create replicas. There are historic trade programs at Colonial Williamsburg and the Glass House at J Jamestown. I think this is actually, this is something really interesting as well is that like if we were in a room right now, I would ask you all to raise your hand if your institution has a storage problem. 
all of us, none of, no one has space, right? Space is in short supply and we're constantly coming up with more space and yet curators are constantly, often acquiring new things. And this is especially in the States where acquisitions are very important. Um, I, thanks everybody for the positive feedback as well. Thanks very much. Um, but, uh, oh, what was I just talking about? Acquiring things, oh, storage, sorry. We have a lot of materials that no one is gonna put on display. No one is gonna, you know, no one's gonna put them on exhibition. No one's gonna ask for them on loan. Why do we have them? And it makes, and this is a conservation problem because you're constantly trying to figure out how to store things. And you're like, why am I storing this? It could, because it's, it's important to preserve indefinitely. Okay, well, what if I got it out and I gave it to a bunch of kindergarten students so they could figure out how to make, you know, baskets. Um, so I feel like this is really, thank you, ethics of care. Thank you very much, Anissa. Um, and apologies to the ASL translator because I jump around a lot. You're doing an amazing job. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, just that we have so many objects. We have, we're hoarding materials. We're hoarding cultural materials. And why can't we make them more accessible? Why can't they be accessible for handling sessions? Um, that's something that's really important to me. Yeah. Um, can you see anything else in the chat here? I see Sina again. Hi, Sina. There we go. There's a recommendation of a book, Ethics of Care. Very good. Um, Yasomi Amolu with a link, which is very useful. Thank you very much for that. Oh, I was going to drop you some links, wasn't I? And um, Tim made a comment about digital. Um, to visit a science museum that everything in his institution is digital. Yeah, that's another thing. Digital accessibility. How can conservators facilitate digital accessibility? How can we use imaging in interesting ways? Um, how can we build digital exhibitions and how can we put our technical study and technical expertise um, into to digital exhibitions, online exhibitions and try to make that a little more accessible? People love looking at x-rays. You know, um, I think that's a really positive way to go. So I wanted to drop here um, the Conservation Code of Ethics, and that's the AIC, the American Institute for Conservation Code of Ethics. Uh, I also dropped a link to the Pitt Rivers Museum's collaboration with the Haida, Haida people. Uh, and Pitt Rivers generally has a lot of really interesting projects where they bring in practitioners um, and they bring in material specialists and they also bring in, you know, as many anthropological collections do, they bring in a lot of um, source communities to, to consult. Um, I won't say collaborate because it doesn't feel like collaboration, it feels more like consultation. They're different, right? As one friend of mine put it, if you don't know the budget, you aren't a collaborator. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, a link to the Haida project that I spoke about earlier, and then a link to the Ind Endangered Material Knowledge Program, um, just with that specific project, but please poke around, they have a lot of projects, and it is, again, it's the British Museum, it's hosted at the British Museum, um, it's very global, so again, it's that more of an anthropological type focus. <laughs> I'm so glad you're at the dentist office. That's fantastic. Um, okay, and then I dropped in a link to Julia's uh, work that she's done with Southeast Asian colleagues on looking at care and methods and techniques for textile conservation, uh, which are local to Southeast Asia um, and local practitioners. And again, a lot of preserved knowledge from um, aging populations. Um, I just, um, a minutes. I just wondered if you could tell us about some of the material that you're currently working on. <laughs> Me? <laughs> um, so I, what am I doing? I'm actually in a moment of transition. Right now, the material I'm working on is students um, <laughs> because I'm, tr I'm trying to help them be trained as conservators uh, in an ethical, rigorous, forward-looking, community-based way. Um, so it's partially, that's part of my, my practice of knowledge exchange. 
Um, and then there is my dissertation, which is on the use of human remains in Tibetan ritual objects. Uh, so it's really looking at how human remains have been instrumentalized uh, for Buddhist and ritual practice um, and how they um, how they how they function as a substrate for cultural objects within this particular uh, ritual and cultural um, system, I suppose. Um, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. I'm also about to change jobs. Um, so I'm actually going to be the research conservator at the Museum of Archaeological and Anthropology of Archaeology and Anthropology at Cambridge University, which I can't even say properly because I actually just learned that I was offered this post only three days ago. So I'm not working on it. But yeah, so I'm very much going back to um, what I know, which is working with anthropological and archaeological collections um, and really working in a hands-on way because that's very important to me um, now, especially that I've done five years of you know, research, uh, which has looked a lot more like sitting behind my, my laptop, especially the last year, obviously. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you very much for getting a great compliments in our chat room. No, thank you, everybody. It's, I've never done this before, and it was honestly, um, I just couldn't imagine that we could have this conversation in within like a conservation professional group because we've we've tried uh, in the past and I've always been a bit disappointed by how far we get. So I was hoping that this this would be the space where we could actually <laughs> critique conservation and try and imagine it, you know, kind of coming out of from behind the curtain. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks. It's really it's been such a special thing to be a part of. I'm really I'm quite honored. Thank you so much. It's um, it's a perfect example of disrupt, dismantle, and manifest. So I'm going to now share my screen. And I'm hope I want to invite everyone to stay with us for the rest of the day. Um, at two o'clock, we'll be hearing from Portia Moore and Rose Kinsey and Nikia for Betty on why cultural institutions should advocate for defunding of local police departments. Um, and the final one, um, which is going to be of great interest to everyone, is on museum unions. And that will be at 4 o'clock. And then at 6 o'clock, we will all get back together and do an anti-conference closing, which should be really interesting and um, definitely looking forward to it. Thank you all for coming. And I wanna thank the ASL interpreters who were spelling out words with speed of light. <laughs> and um, welcome you all to come back at two o'clock.